Okay, so this is uh, a presentation to help you revise for the LVO 2.1K online test. Um, so in this example, question one is about wet sump lubrication systems. So let's just do a, a review of wet and dry sump systems. What I've got here is an image of an engine that has a wet sump system. Now you can see the sump on the bottom of the engine and uh, I've chosen this one to show you how deep that sump is. So the oil gets pumped around the main body of the engine and lubricates all the bearings and then eventually drains back down and is collected. So it runs from the back to the front and collected in this reservoir called the sump. There's the drain bung. Uh, that you'll all be familiar with. That's how we get the oil out. Just got another image here of a sump again, just to show you uh, that it flows from the back to the front, usually collects in this area here. And you can see how deep that is. And that has the effect of making the engine very tall. So that means uh, that our bonnet line, you know, the bodywork of the car has to be fairly high to accommodate a tall engine and the engine is also uh, mounted some of the weight is quite high up so the engines mounted fairly high okay if we just compare that to the layout of a dry sump system so I've got a couple of images here um, this one obviously the cylinder head has been taken off so it's slightly different but you can see the sump here in fact I'll just bring in another image here that's uh, taking it's the same engine just taken from a different angle and you can see that the sump is much, much shallower on what we call this dry sump system. So the overall effect is that the, the engine is much uh, less tall, if you like, it's much shorter. Uh, we've got this additional pump that you can see is belt driven from the engine. This is called the scavenge pump. And what it does, it draws any oil that sort of fit, floods into this very shallow sump is then drawn up by the scavenge pump and then pumped onto or into a separate reservoir which could be anywhere on the car it doesn't have to be in you know, it reduces the the need to have such a deep sump we can store our oil elsewhere okay so let's just move on uh, to another couple of images here back to the question but i just wanted to show you these other images uh, these diagrams are just simplified versions of a wet and dry sump system so this is a wet sump system and as you can see that's the, the most common it's what most cars that we will work on have where the oil drains from the engine components drips down and collects in a deep sump where it's then picked up uh, through a strainer to strain out any any debris and then is pumped uh, by the engine pump uh, through a filter and then back through the bearings right so we have a nice deep sump as opposed to our wet sump sorry our, sorry our dry sump system uh, where we have a much much shallower sump uh, the oil is again it's picked up by the scavenge pump which pumps into a separate reservoir or separate tank and then you have the conventional layout where a pump pumps it through a filter and it still goes through all the bearings in the engine but the beauty is, as I say, that we can have a much shallower sump and the engine can be mounted much lower down. So back to the question, uh, a wet sump lubrication system has the oil stored in. So this is the wet sump, the more conventional system. Where's the oil stored? Well, it's stored down here in the reservoir that we call the sump. So uh, I would go for this answer here. OK, let's move on to the next question. So question two is uh, this one here, water in the engine oil is most likely caused by. So um, it's basically um, asking how do we, how would water get mixed with our oil? Now uh, from this, there's, uh, let's just run through them, worn cylinder liner, defective wet, wet liner seals, underfilled radiator or an overfilled radiator. Okay, so the last two here, uh, over or underfilled radiator, that's unlikely to cause uh, be a cause for engine oil getting mixed with our coolant. So I'm going to rule those two out, and that leaves me with something to do with liners. All right, so we need to have a, a review of what liners are. So I've got some images here. 
this first one is an image of a it's actually a v6 engine with the cylinder heads taken off but what i want you to be aware of is that this block the engine block is made from cast aluminium alloy now most of you will know that aluminium alloy is very light so it makes our engine block very light but it's not a particularly hard wearing material i'm sure you've all seen uh, aluminium alloy wheels with dents in them all right so it's not particularly hard material so if we were to run a piston with piston rings uh, in just aluminium alloy it would wear out very quickly so in this one you can see uh, quite clearly that's why i've chosen this image that they have inserted cast iron liners now uh, cast iron is very very hard wearing we use it to make brake discs and brake components in general all right because it's very hard wearing so the piston will run up and down inside this and the piston rings will rub against the side and obviously there will be somewhere but uh, it's much more resistant to wear or than than the uh, aluminium alloy so we've got a uh, the main block is nice and light but we've got a hardened insert a liner that lines uh, the, the engine block. So that's what liners are. Uh, I'll show you some other images. Uh, there's a cylinder liner, cast iron, uh, it's been removed from the block. And here's an image of a block where the, the liner has been removed. Now this type of engine is referred to as a wet liner. So when that liner is inserted in, uh, there'd be a rubber seal um, or a silicon rubber seal that sits at the bottom and uh, the idea is that coolant can be pumped around inside the block and physically makes contact with this side the outside of, of the liner to keep it nice and cool so it's called a wet liner because it's in contact with the coolant in this system okay and as I say it's kind of important when we go back to the question to be aware that there are rubber or silicon rubber seals uh, that prevent the, the, the uh, ingress of water into our oil. So we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, before I move on, I just wanted to show you another uh, kind of system. So there, again, there's an aluminium alloy block. And in this one, you can see that it has one liner inserted. But the reason I've shown you this image is that you can see that the coolant well, that's the point you can't see the coolant jacket it's a solid aluminium alloy block and the insert has uh, is, is in contact with the aluminium alloy all right so this would be referred to as a dry liner because there is no contact between the coolant and the liner just go back to see the previous image all right in this one the liner would uh, be inserted in but the coolant that flows around the outside would be in direct contact with it. So this is a wet liner and this one here is a dry liner. So let's just, uh, oh, there's, there's the comparison of the two side by side. Uh, just for interest as well, if uh, that, that uh, rubber seal at the bottom did leak and water got mixed with your oil, this is the effect that it has. All right, the, uh, there's a, an image here where the guy has taken off the oil filler cap and you get this, uh, what they refer to as an emulsion. Sometimes mechanics call it mayonnaise because it looks a bit like mayonnaise, that kind of colour. And uh, it's, uh, it's technically it's called an emulsion, a bit like emulsion paint. Um, it has that same consistency. That's what happens when oil gets mixed with your coolant. You create this emulsion. Anyway, back to the question. The question was, uh, water in the engine oil is most likely caused by, and as I say, we ruled out the radiator problems, or I ruled those out, but uh, a worn cylinder liner, well, wear and tear is expected, uh, so it's not likely to be that, but if we had a defective wet liner seal, so those silicon seals at the bottom of the liner, if they were defective, then the coolant could leak past and get mixed with the oil. So that's the one I would go for. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So question three is, when stripping an engine, you are asked to find out its cubic capacity or the CC. 
which of the following actions would assist you to find the correct answer? So I'm just going to bring in an image of, actually this is the four stroke cycle, but it's got four cylinders. That's the reason I've chosen it. So it's a typical kind of engine layout and that will help us uh, consider these answers. So the first answer that they suggest is we need to measure the bore and the cylinder length. Well, that's information that we do need, but we need more than just that information uh, because there are four of them. So we need to at least multiply it by four. OK, let's just read the, the, the other suggested answers. B, measure the bore and the cylinder head gasket thickness. OK, well, the head gasket will affect the overall capacity. But again, it's not all of the information that we need. So let's check C, measure the bore and the connecting rod length. All right, so the diameter of the bore and how far uh, or the, the connecting rod length would give you an indication of, of how far the piston travels, but that's not really relevant information. All right, we need to know actually how far the, the piston travels, not how long that connecting rod is. Uh, part D or question, sorry, answer D is, uh, we measure the bore, so work out the diameter of the bore, the distance the piston moves from bottom dead centre to top dead centre. Okay, that's exactly the information we need. All right, and then, then once we've worked out the capacity of a single cylinder, we need to multiply that by however many cylinders we've got. So we need to count the number of cylinders. All right, so hopefully you can see that answer D is the correct answer. But it's important that you read all of the possible answers, right? Because the first two are partly correct, but they, they don't have all of the information that we need. Okay, so question four, the compression ratio of a compression ignition engine is normally, and then we've got a, a range of answers. Okay, uh, so, a ratio is always presented using a colon, which is the two dots that I'm hovering over now. So answer A is a ratio. It says between 9 and 10 to 1. So it's a ratio of, say, 10 to 1. So that is a ratio. But answer B, 80 to 90%. 80 to 90% is not a ratio. It's a percentage. So it can't be answer B. Answer C, 180, sorry, 150 to 180 atmospheres. Uh, that is a measure of pressure. All right, so, uh, an actual measurement, again, not a ratio. So it can't be answer C. Answer D, it has the colons. Let's just read it. So between 16 to 22 to 1. So 22 to 1 is definitely a ratio. So we've got a ratio in uh, answer A, which is 10 to 1, and a ratio in D, which is 22 to 1. OK, so we have got two possible answers. Uh, let's go back and revisit the question. The compression ratio of a compression ignition engine compression ignition engines are diesel engines all right remember petrol engines are referred to as spark ignition so the question is about a diesel engine where we're relying on a very high compression ratio to heat the the, the air up and it's that temperature which ignites the diesel so we need a very high compression ratio in a compression ignition engine so we've got two possible answers uh, what we know is we need the the higher one. So in this case, it's going to be between 16 and 22 to 1. Answer D. Question 5 is an engine which does not have a pressure charged induction system fitted is referred to as. So the induction system is talking about uh, how we induce air and fuel to flow into the engine. How do we get air and fuel in? That's through the induction system on our engine. And if our induction system doesn't have a pressure charger or isn't pressure charged, it's referred to as something. So what's a pressure charger? Well, that's why I've got this image here. 
This image uh, it's got the faded out engine and it's highlighted the exhaust manifold. And uh, the reason I've chosen to show you this picture is because it has a turbo fitted to the exhaust manifold. And what the turbo does is it forces fresh air into the engine. How it works basically, uh, the exhaust gases are pushed, but the pistons push the exhaust gases out. So they're flowing out with quite a lot of force. And as they flow through the exhaust pipe, they spin a turbine, which is a bit like a fan. Uh, so as the gases flow past the fan, they drive the, the turbine around, which in turn on the other end of the shaft over here has another fan called an impeller, uh, which as that spins, that blows fresh air, which will be ducted through a pipe to the intake side of the engine. So we're uh, pressure charging, we're increasing the pressure by blowing uh, air into the engine, we can mix extra fuel with that extra air. So this is a pressure charged system. Now an engine that doesn't have a turbo or a supercharger or doesn't have any charging fitted to the induction system is referred to as one of these options. Okay, uh, a four stroke engine, well, not all four stroke engines are pressure charged volumetrically efficient well it will be volumetric if volumetrically efficient but that's not the term that we're after in this case a two-stroke engine not necessarily so that leaves naturally aspirated which is the correct answer but just in case you're not familiar with the word aspirated i googled um, aspirated and it came up with aspirate and i've highlighted you can see it's to do with breathing so to breathe air out or to breathe air in okay so this is referring to naturally aspirating so the the engine is breathing naturally it's not got a pressure charger so an engine which does not have a pressure charged induction system is referred to as naturally aspirated okay so question six <clears throat> When checking liquid coolant for the content of antifreeze, you would use a, uh, and a list of tools here. Now the tools that you would use, I've just got an image there, it's one of these. Uh, some of them in the college look a bit like this, so they come in different shapes and sizes. But essentially you have a uh, rubber bulb which is squeezed and that draws the coolant into it and then we can take a reading. The name of this tool, is it a hydrometer, an odometer, a thermometer or a pyrometer? Um, uh, an odometer is part of your speedo, that's what tells you your mileage. A thermometer tells you temperature. Now these things don't tell you temperature, they tell you how much antifreeze there is. Uh, is it a pyrom pyrometer or a pyrometer? Uh, again, that's to do with measuring um, fire and heat. Okay, so the only one that makes any sense is a hydrometer. Question seven, it is important to maintain engine valve clearances because it decreases the length of the valve, it increases the noise of the engine, it affects the oil consumption, or finally, it affects engine power. Let's just bring up an image uh, from one of my previous videos, which was to try and explain the importance of valve clearance. So we need a clearance between the top of the valve and the, the, the bottom of the cam when the valve is closed. That's why we have a clearance. Now, if we don't maintain these clearances, the valve is going to open earlier or later because the camshaft will have to move further before it actually makes contact and starts opening that valve and if your valves aren't open for long enough or alternatively if they're open for too long but either way you won't be allowing the correct amount of air and fuel to enter your engine so if you get that wrong you are going to produce less power all right, uh, it won't decrease the length of the valve, uh, 
that's not going to physically change. Uh, the noise, okay, that may change if you don't uh, keep the clearances adjusted, but it's not the most important answer. Uh, affects oil consumption, it's not related. Adjusting that clearance isn't going to stop uh, your engine burning oil if that's what it's doing but it will affect the engine power because if you get this wrong, the valves open and close at the incorrect time. Question eight is in a full flow lubrication system. So it's a question about full flow lubrication systems. So before we look at the possible answers, uh, I'd like to just have a quick review of both full flow and bypass systems. This image represents uh, the layout of a full flow system. So let's just talk you through what we've got here. At the bottom of the image, we have our reservoir, so the sump, if you like. Uh, the yellow is meant to represent the oil in the sump. Over here, we have our oil pump. Uh, the two circles represent the gears in a gear type pump. So the pump draws the oil up from the sump and creates oil pressure in the system. If the pressure's too high, our regulator valve will open and allow some of it to be dumped back into the sump. But assuming that's okay, oil is forced through, and, uh, through the system up and through our oil filter before it can go on and lubricate all the bearings in the engine. So it's a full flow system because all of the oil goes through the oil filter. So it flows fully through the oil filter, hence the name full flow lubrication system. As an alternative to that, the second image is what we call a bypass system. So it's very similar layout. We've got the sump down at the bottom, the oil pump, the regulator, everything there is, is identical to, to this one. The difference being that the oil is allowed to flow directly to the bearings and then back to the sump, but some of the oil is allowed to go through and be filtered before it's returned to the sump. Okay, so this is a bypass system because most of the oil is allowed to by bypass the, the, the filter and lubricate the bearings directly. All right, so the two alternatives. All right, in both of them, the oil is being filtered and any debris is filtered out. Um, there are pros and cons for both of them. Uh, on most people would assume uh, that this one is uh, is the better option because it's better to have all of the debris filtered out and have relatively clean oil going to the bearings. And that does make sense. The problem is if we don't maintain or if our customer doesn't follow the service schedule and misses an oil filter change, or misses more than one oil filter change, eventually this oil filter is going to get clogged up and blocked. And uh, at that point, no oil will be able to get to the bearings. Whereas with this one, uh, even if the filter did get clogged up and blocked up, uh, there would still be oil getting to the bearings. So their argument over here, the manufacturers that choose this variant, their argument is that it's better to have uh, oil flowing to the bearings that's unfiltered than to have no oil flowing to the bearings. All right, so as I say, pros and cons. All right, but this one is considered to be a full flow system where all of the oil flows through the filter. So let's just have a look at the question. In a full flow lubrication system, some oil is fed to the crankshaft. Well, no, that's not true. Uh, all the oil is picked up through a fine strainer, pumped around the engine and back to the sump. Uh, answer C, all the oil is pumped around the engine and then through the filter. And D, all the oil is fed through the filter to the engine bearings. All right, so the answer would be answer D. All of the oil goes through the filter before it goes to the bearings. Question nine, 
A vehicle is presented for repair which has air bubbles in the cooling system when the engine is running. This could indicate a defective thermostat, a blocked heater matrix, a faulty head gasket or a defective radiator cap. Okay, if you're getting air bubbles, it's uh, basically what's going to happen, the piston is going to come up and if our head gasket is leaking basically that compressed air will leak past the faulty gasket and it will allow that, that compressed gas to get into our galleries here which allow the coolant to flow around the engine so that's what the bubbles are so basically if your head gasket is faulty you are likely to get air bubbles in the cooling system uh, a four-cylinder, four-stroke, inline engine has a firing order of one, two, four, three. If cylinder number three is on the induction stroke, what will the other cylinders be doing is basically the question. So I'm going to bring in an image of an engine and uh, the pistons will be numbered from the front to the back. So I know this is the back of my engine because that's meant to represent the flywheel. So in this case, this would be one, two, three, four. Okay, we know that number three is traveling downwards. Number three, as it says up here, is on the induction stroke. So number three will have been moving downwards to draw uh, fresh air from the outside to fill the chamber, inducing the air to flow in on the induction stroke. Now, because number three was traveling downwards, we now know that number two must have also been traveling downwards because the two central pistons move together and the two outer ones move together. So number two and number three were traveling downwards, which means that number one and number four were moving upwards. So let's just look at the possible answers. Cylinder number one will be on the power stroke. Well, power is uh, a downward stroke the spark goes off when the pistons at the top and as the fuel burns that expands and that's what forces the piston down now number one was traveling upwards so it can't have been on the power stroke number two would uh, it's, it says number two will be on the compression stroke well we know that number two was traveling downwards and compression is an upward movement so it can't have been on the compression stroke. Cylinder number two will be on the exhaust stroke. Well, again, exhaust is uh, an upward movement to push the exhausted gases out through the exhaust pipe. And we know that number two was moving downwards. So it can't have been on the exhaust stroke. Cylinder number two will be on the power stroke. And the power stroke is a downward movement. The spark goes off and forces the piston down. So that's the most likely. In fact, it's the only answer. Cylinder number two will be on the power stroke. As the engine warms up, the tappet clearance will. Um, we've got a list of possible answers. Before we consider those, let's just have a look at this image. Basically, as the engine warms up, the metal components, and in particular the valve stem here, is going to expand and uh, it has what we call linear expansion. So as the metal warms up, it all expands. That means that this valve stem will actually get longer. So the clearance here, the gap between the top of the valve stem and the bottom of the cam will get smaller because the valve stem is actually getting longer. So the clearance will reduce. Let's have a look at the answers. As the engine warms up, the tappet clearance will become zero. Well, it shouldn't ever get to the point where it becomes zero, so it shouldn't be zero. Remain unaltered, well, we know it's going to change. Increase slightly, where well, the gap won't get bigger. It will decrease slightly as the metal expands and the gap reduces. Okay, so it's D. So question 12 says it is important to have a pressure relief valve fitted in the cooling system to allow for something. 
So I'm going to bring in an image of a pressure relief valve. It's usually built into what we would call the radiator cap. So there's an image of a radiator cap. And this diagram here is a cross section. So if you imagine it cut directly through the middle, uh, that's what we would see. Now, the rubber seal at the bottom is represented here. And you can see that that rubber seal is forced downwards to make contact with the lip on the neck of the radiator. And it's pushed down by this spring that's built inside into the cap. So what that does is we put the cap on and it seals the radiator. Now as the engine warms up, the coolant that's below uh, this pressure cap will start to warm up and anything when it warms up will start to expand. So as it expands, the pressure in here gets larger and larger, it increases pressure. Now we need that increase in pressure because that uh, increases the boiling point of the coolant, if you remember that, which is a good thing. We don't want our coolant to boil. But if we allow the pressure to just keep on getting greater and greater and greater, eventually our uh, components are going to, um, our rubber hoses, for example, would explode, they'd split open or the seals would break and we would start to lose our coolant. So we need some pressure, but we don't need excessively high pressure. So we have this uh, pressure release valve built in. This is the pressure relief valve. And what it does, it um, opens up if the pressure gets excessive due to excessive expansion of the coolant. So let's just look at the possible answers. Uh, we need a uh, pressure relief valve to allow for contraction of hot coolant. Well, contraction is what happens when it cools down. So as it warms up, it expands, and then as it cools down, it contracts. So it's not to do with contraction. Uh, the results of passenger heater operation, not related to that. Uh, we need a release valve to allow for the results of corrosion. No, the relief valve won't affect corrosion. But we do need a pressure relief valve uh, to allow for excessive expansion of the hot coolant. So it's to allow for the expansion of hot coolant. Question 13 is uh, a rotary engine has, and we have a list of components, and you've got to identify which list is appropriate for a rotary engine. So I'm just going to bring in this image of a rotary engine. Now this one is produced by Mazda um, and they used it in their MX-8 Coupe until very recently um, but that has now gone out of production. So as far as I'm aware there are no manufacturers using this type of engine. Um, it's very different from a conventional piston engine. As you can see there are no pistons that move up and down or reciprocate. Instead, you have this uh, sort of three-sided rotor that rotates within this uh, sort of oval shape. Um, okay, uh, let's have a look at the question. A rotary engine has triangular pistons and poppet valves. Well, it has this almost triangular rotor, but that's not a piston and there are no poppet valves at all. So it's not A. An adjustable compression ratio, well, that's not true. Uh, more reciprocating parts, this should say, than a piston engine. Uh, well, there's no reciprocating parts. This is a rotor, it rotates, it doesn't move up and down. Uh, a three-sided rotor and an epitroidal liner, well, this is the name of the shape given to this and as you can see I struggle with saying that word all right but uh, this is the correct answer it has this three-sided rotor all right so the answer is D let's move on question 14 a coolant leak from behind the dashboard and the smell of coolant inside the car could indicate all right so I'm just going to bring in this image to help uh, this is, um, I found this on the website, a website, so it's, as you can see, it's a left-hand drive car, but that's irrelevant, really. What I wanted to show you was the heater matrix. 
It looks a bit like a radiator uh, that's inside the car and so the hot coolant from the engine is pumped through and it flows through these little pipes that you can see here. Uh, this looks very similar to the radiator that you would find under the bonnet but it's inside the car usually behind dashboard and center console components and we can have a, a, an electric fan behind it that blows air through the radiator and so we get warm air inside the car so that's how we warm up. Okay so let's have a look at the question again. A coolant leak from behind the dashboard and a smell of coolant inside the car would indicate a burst top hose, a broken fan belt, a faulty thermostat or a leaking heater matrix. Well, hopefully you can see if this heater matrix had developed a leak we would get coolant inside the car and we would get a strong smell of coolant because we'd be in the car. So the answer is D. Let's move on to number 15. Which of the following requires the use of a precision straight edge and feeler gauges? So in the image you can see I've uh, found a precision straight edge. It's very precisely machined so that we have a very straight edge on it. And as you can see from this image, this person has laid it across a cylinder head. And if we can slide feeler gauges underneath at different points, then that would indicate that the cylinder head must be distorted. If the cylinder head was perfectly flat, and we've got a flat straight edge laying on it, then theoretically we shouldn't be able to get anything underneath. Okay, so this is for checking whether our cylinder head is distorted. So which of the following requires the use of a precision straight edge and feeling, feeling gauges? Checking the piston ring groove clearance, checking for cylinder head warp, sounds good to me. Check the other zone, checking for cylinder bore wear or checking the valve face angle. Okay, well the correct answer is checking the head for, uh, the cylinder head for distortion, whether it's warped. So that's number 15. Let's have a look at number 16. Oh, sorry, there's another image there, um, just doing the same sort of thing. So question 16. When fitting a piston to a compression ignition engine, how should the gaps in the piston rings be spaced? Okay, I'm just going to show you an image here. So this particular piston has uh, an oil scraper ring and then one, two compression rings. So that's fairly common. Um, so there are effectively three piston rings and what we need is the gaps in the piston rings to not all line up. If you look at this image here, you can see a gap here. Now, if the, that one lined up with a gap on this one, which in turn lined up the gap on this one, we would have three gaps in a, all lined up and that wouldn't seal. And so we would get leaking compression. So we need to space them. And as you can see on this diagram, uh, they've arranged it so that they are 120 degrees, 120 degrees, 120 degrees. If you add, uh, three lots of 120, you end up with your 360 degrees. So because you've got three sets of piston rings, you need them uh, spaced evenly. So the answer is going to be uh, 120 degrees apart with no gaps facing a thrust surface. Let's just check the other answers. It doesn't really matter because they will all move when the engine runs. Well, that's not necessarily correct. 180 degrees apart. Uh, well, as you can see, it's not 180, it's 120. And the first gap should be in line with the crankshaft and the others should be opposite each other. Okay, the best answer there is the 120 degrees apart. Okay, and the last question in this test was number 17. The oil viscosity suitable for a current petrol engine is most likely to be and then it gave you a range of options. By the way, SAE stands for Society of Automotive Engineers. It's a, uh, an American or a US organization um, that uh, monitors the viscosity of oil and the rest of the world has pretty much adopted 
these standards as well as other standards. But okay, so SAE, Society of Automotive Engineering, and these numbers represent uh, how quickly uh, the oil can flow through from 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 a container through a small hole in the container, which is determined by the Society of Automotive Engineers, and the numbers represent how quickly it flows. Okay, so it's really basically this is you know just sort of general knowledge that you would pick up in the workshop, and um, I've picked up this image from the internet. And as you can see, this is a fairly common engine oil, 10W40. All right, this is an engine oil. So the, the best answer here would be C, which is SAE 10W or 1040.